Democrats. Chairman Henry Waxman of California has just gaveled in. This is live coverage on C-SPAN 3. Uh, fair way you've conducted this markup this week. and This is a very difficult subject. It's a very complicated subject, it's a subject that there are strong feelings on both sides about. It would be an easy markup to uh, get lose control and uh, uh, let tempers flare, but that's not happened, and, and uh, that is a, a tribute to your chairmanship. Uh, with regard to today's schedule, is, as you well know, you and I had a meeting last evening, and um, we have agreed that uh, it wouldn't be to the benefit of the committee or the comedy between the members if um, sometime this afternoon we begin to engage in parliamentary procedures that would uh, force either a, a reading of the bill which are an amendment which would take it beyond the uh, scheduled uh, closure time or a previous question motion by the majority which would uh, uh, violate the traditions of the committee. So we have agreed to, to expedite the process today in terms of amendments and to put time limits on each amendment, approximately 10 minutes per side at the maximum. Uh, in, in return, we will have a final passage vote sometime this afternoon, uh, within an hour or so after the House uh, concludes its business. And when we come back after the um, uh, memorial work period, uh, you have um, committed to holding at least one day of hearing on the uh, cap and trade allowance system, and if possible, two days of hearings that would be fair and balanced so that we can um, get into some of the issues that we've not yet been able to get into, just understanding what the mechanism is of the um, programs in Title III and Title IV. Okay. I, I want to thank uh, Mr. Barton for his uh, cooperation in making this a uh, uh, as, a sm as smooth a markup as it has been up to this point. I know there are strong feelings uh, on this issue, and uh, it's important that we work through the, the consideration of various proposals uh, in, a, uh, in a spirit of comedy and, uh, and, and, and uh, tolerance and receptivity. Uh, we do have a lot of work to do with not a great deal of time and I think it makes sense to uh, set time limits for the amendments that we'll be considering today. We've already seen some amendments that we've considered up to this point have taken an hour and a half to two hours, where I think we could have shortened the period of time for discussion. So if we try uh, to discipline ourselves on both sides, and the Republican side has uh, 20 amendments, we uh, figure that on our side we'll have five to ten amendments. Uh, if we limit the time to uh, uh, no more than ten minutes per side, and many of the amendments will be ten minutes total, five minutes on each side, and we'll have to make an evaluation uh, uh, as we go through the consideration of the amendments, I think that would uh, allow us to be able to give the priority amendments on both sides uh, consideration and an opportunity for members to vote on them. We will have three series of votes on the House floor today, so we, our work will not be uninterrupted. I, I have agreed with uh, Mr. Barton that we will hold at least one day, full day of hearings on uh, how the transmission, how the, uh, the, the, the allo allocation system will work, uh, and, and the mechanisms of it, and uh, and so we can get a, a greater spotlight on uh, the mechanics of it all. And I think that would be a valuable hearing, and I've agreed that we will uh, pursue that. Uh, we will, in fact, hold that day of hearings, and then see if we have time and, and reason to uh, have additional hearings on the subject. So, with that uh, understanding. I'd like to have us move forward now. Can I ask 
Uh, yes, gentleman from Nebraska. Uh, in regard to the agreement on the hearings, was there any discussion of whether that's a full committee or subcommittee? So those of us that aren't on the subcommittee can participate. It gives my specific interest. I, I would. We haven't. We hadn't discussed that specifically. But I think the best approach would be to have it in the subcommittee, and all members who wish to attend may be able to participate. For the uh, first amendment uh, this morning, I want to recognize the gentleman from Ohio. Mr. Space, for what I think is one of the most important and significant amendments that we're going to have to this legislation. Uh, Mr. Space, you have an amendment at the desk. I'd ask you, I'd ask unanimous consent, the, uh, I'd ask unanimous consent that the, the amendment be considered as read, and I'd like to recognize a, a gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Space, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as all of us know, this bill allocates emissions uh, to electricity local distribution companies, uh, the specific nature of which are located on page 553 of the bill in its present form, as well as to natural gas uh, local distribution companies, which uh, are located on page 554, both within section 782. Uh, the purpose of this amendment, which is being circulated as I speak, is to clarify and make certain that these allocated emissions uh, or allocated emission allowances remit directly to the benefit of retail ratepayers. Uh, all of us have uh, concerns about the effect that this legislation may have on consumers generally, and uh, this bill has uh, made numerous attempts to uh, mitigate uh, those concerns. This amendment helps to specify and again make certain that these allowances in particular are uh, intended to benefit and will indeed benefit uh, the retail ratepayers. Uh, the amendment affects not just the uh, uh, submission of these allowances, but also the auditing provisions of the bill itself. Uh, I think it's a positive change in all directions and will provide uh, some level of protection and assurances to uh, the little guy out there. Yield back, Mr. Uh, Chairman. If the gentleman would yield to me. On, on his time, uh, Mr. Space, I, I, uh, I think this amendment uh, will reinforce one of the central policies of this bill, and that's protecting ratepayers. Our bill requires that allowances given to electricity and gas utilities must be used for the benefit of retail ratepayers. And this amendment strengthens these important provisions by making this policy even more explicit. For example, under the bill's allowance distribution provisions, EPA is required to audit a representative sample of electric distribution companies. Under the Space Amendment, it would be clear that these audits will be focused on ensuring that emission allowances have been used exclusively for the benefit of retail ratepayers. The heart of this bill is the protection of the ratepayer. The Space Amendment strengthens the provisions that are already in place and I would certainly urge my colleagues to support this amendment. Mr. Chairman. The gentleman uh, yields back his time, and the chair will recognize Mr. Barton. And I'll be hap happy to yield some of my time to Mr. Walden. Ask the council a question. Could you define retail ratepayer? I'm sorry, sir. The question was, have we defined retail ratepayer in this? What is the definition of retail ratepayer? It's not defined in the statute. Okay. Would a um, would a small dry cleaning business be a retail rate payer? If if the dry cleaner is uh, paying an electricity bill. Would a um, um, small manufacturing facility that uses electricity to run its processes be a retail rate payer? If it's paying an electricity bill. So anybody that pays an electricity bill is a retail rate payer. Yes. Does the author of the amendment agree with that? I agree. If they're purchasing uh, f uh, that electricity from an electric and actually a natural gas uh, uh, distribution company as well, applies to both natural gas and electricity uh, distribution companies. So, so your definition of retail rate payer is not exclusive to um, homeowners and um, condos and apartments. It includes small businesses and uh, manufacturing facilities. 
basically anybody that doesn't have a direct industrial contract uh, with uh, the electricity uh, provider. That is correct. I, um, I'll yield to Mr. Walden. Thank, thank you, Mr. Barton. Uh, that was the question I was going to go after. But what assurance, I mean, I, I appreciate your opinion, um, but what assurance do we have in statute? Is, is retail ratepayer defined anywhere in the statutes? No, it is not. So it is commonly assumed that that is anybody who pays an electricity bill or a gas bill under this circumstance will be considered a retail rate payer. So long as they purchase it from a local electricity or in, in the case of a natural gas distribution company, yes. What about situations like where you're, and I may be wrong on this, but this is all coming at us fast, um, like Bonneville Power Administration has DSIs. These are industries that purchase directly power. I believe they're allocated power directly from the Bonneville Power Administration. Would they qualify if you're a DSI? I'm sorry, I missed the question, sir. Someone was talking to me. It happens. Um, I, I'm sympathetic I'm with sorry. you. I'm um, sorry. DSI is a direct service industry, so they purchase power directly from, I believe, Bonneville Power Administration. Would they be treated as a retail uh, rate payer? I don't know. If it comes from one of the, the, the power marketing agencies like TVA, T Tennessee Valley Authority, or Bonneville Power Administration. The, the bill, if, if I could. Uh, Certainly, yeah. I, the, gentleman, uh, the bill itself provides for allowances to be distributed by, specifically by, uh, natural gas local distribution companies and electricity local distribution companies. If uh, these are uh, rate payers purchasing their power from those local distribution companies, they are considered uh, purchasing uh, retail power uh, and are rate payers pursuant to the amendment, and I believe the bill itself. Right. So my question is, is are the, are the uh, organizations like Bonneville Power Administration considered an, uh, a local distribution uh, company for purposes of this act? No. I can't be. I would refer to counsel for the definition of uh, local distribution company. You no, know, I, I appreciate that, yeah. So I'm, I'm just asking your professional opinion no. to counsel. Because they're a generation, they're a generation company. I, I think I understand the intent of the, the legislation and, and the definition. Gentlemen intent. Yield, yes, this, certainly. This is a, a power company purchasing from another power company. Is that N no? This would be an industrial user that purchases, I believe, directly, and I may be wrong on this, but I didn't have a chance to, to run this out in advance, directly from Bonneville, for example. Mm -hmm. and, and so my only question is, are these uh, PMA, I think they're PMAs, uh, public market, uh, power, market. power marketing, uh, are, are they considered an LDC for purposes of this act? Because I know it's your intent to do that, but I, I just want to make sure so we're legislating. They, they distribute as well as generate the power? They may, yeah. yeah. The, the definition of electricity local distribution company appears on page 567. It means an electric utility that has a legal, regulatory, or contractual obligation to deliver electricity directly to retail consumers in the United States. Uh, regardless of whether that entity or another entity sells the electricity as a commodity to those consumers, and the retail rates of which, except in the case of a registered electric co-op, are regulated by a state regulatory authority, regulatory commission, municipality, public utility, or by an Indian tribe pursuant to tribal law. And that, again, is on page 567. And so, I'm sorry I got interrupted, too, just a minute. But, but the last qualifier is that they are regulated by a public utility commission of some sort? Uh, the retail rates of which, except in the case of a registered electric cooperative, are regulated by a state uh, authority okay. or some Bo other type of regulatory commission. So Bonneville, I think, goes, does its own rate setting cases. So would they? Gentlemen's time has expired. I don't know that we, we can get a specific answer. The c council will give us a, a, we, a further information to help uh, us reach some conclusion. We, uh, we, I would be. Uh, We're not sure whether Bonneville Power Authority sells wholesale or retail. If they sell wholesale, then uh, it does not appear they would fall within the definition of electric uh, electricity LDC. But they we do don't know wholesale. Bonneville Power's situation. Mr. Chairman, I, and I know we need to move this along. Would would the chair and the author of the amendment be willing to work with us on this? I assume it would be. 
uh, that, that, that you would want to include anybody that's selling power to a retail rate payer. Mr. Chairman, if I might, uh, the, the uh, gentleman's request relates not just to the amendment but to the uh, entirety of the bill itself. Uh, because the question that you've uh, raised about the eligibility of Bonneville uh, for the allowances in question applies regardless of whether this amendment uh, is passed or not. Let me express my willingness to work with the gentleman, talk it through, and see if uh, we can resolve any uh, disagreements. It's one of the reasons we're doing some hearings. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 I'd be willing to ex accept that commitment because I, I think you're, I know, I think I understand what you're trying to get to. I just want to make sure there isn't a group that's been overlooked by, by accident. And I'd certainly be willing to work uh, with the gentleman Perfect. and Thank you. We'll follow up with the. Mr. Uh, Chairman, we are prepared to accept the amendment. The time has expired on the debate. The vote now comes on the uh, space amendment. All those in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes have it and the amendment's agreed to. Who seeks uh, recognition, Mr. Barton, on your side? Mr. Walden. Oh, let me make an announcement. Uh, we work, uh, we've considered <coughs> amendments to Title I. We've considered amendments to Title II. We've considered amendments to Title III. Uh, we're going to uh, open the bill up for amendments to any title. So the bill is open for amendment at any point. So, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. It is uh, actually, I'll throw you a curveball. It's actually Upton 003, which is unrelated to Upton 007, our secret I'll agent a point from of order. Michigan. A point of order has been reserved. The um, gentleman from Oregon is offering an amendment that has the name of the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Upton. And without objection, that amendment will be considered as read. The gentleman from Oregon is recognized to speak. Th thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, the, the purpose of, of this amendment is to build upon um, the notion that renewables are a good thing and that uh, renewable energy that doesn't uh, emit uh, any more than those on the list that you'll find on page 21 uh, that doesn't exceed or, or, uh, or, or perhaps even comes in less should be included. And, of course, as technology is developed, there will be new ones that may not be on this list. So this amendment is really pretty simple. It says any source of electric generation with emissions of air pollutants that do not exceed those of the emission source listed in any of the preceding subparagraphs, which has the highest emission levels of, of air pollutants. So it amends the Clean Air Act and basically says there are some others out there that uh, don't pollute, that should be included. Some new technologies may come along and uh, they should be treated as renewable energy under, under, this, uh, under this act. And I, I would yield to my colleague from Michigan uh, for further comment. Well, thank you. I, I thank the gentleman for offering this brilliant amendment. Uh, I'd note for the record I did vote against cloning, so it is your amendment. Uh, uh, you know, we don't want to pick winners and losers. Uh, the whole purpose is that we have uh, renewable source of energy no matter what the what the cost, and uh, uh, this fits that criteria. And uh, so whether it be woody biomass, whether it be uh, existing hydro or, or new hydro, all those different things ought to qualify as a renewable part of the renewable base. And we're going to have another amendment a little bit later on that, that looks at states that have actually embarked on a renewable portfolio standard. We want those uh, States and uh, to, uh, uh, to to keep their their rights in terms of what they've done as as what they've done to identify their base, uh, but this this is a, a greater universe of, of what would count as renewable, and I, I think it's a very good amendment. I yield my time back to the gentleman from. And I yield back and ask your support on this amendment. Mr. Chairman, I withdraw my point of order. The gentleman withdraws his point of order. The chair uh, recognizes himself in opposition to the amendment. Uh, this amendment sounds neutral in the definition of a renewable, but it in effect would allow nuclear to be considered a renewable fuel. We've had this issue before us a number of times during the committee's consideration of this legislation. Uh, while, while nuclear is, uh, has the enormous advantage of, uh, not, uh, of not emitting uh, carbon dioxide, it is not a renewable fuel. It's based uh, on, on um, fuel from uranium, 
which is uh, mined, which is not renewable. It's similar to coal uh, in that sense. And when we defined uh, renewable, uh, the idea of having nuclear as part of the definition was not what was uh, what what uh, those who support renewables had in mind. It's already a new a technology that's been available, been in use, uh, plays a very important and valuable role in our portfolio of energy supplies. Uh, but if we had uh, nuclear considered a renewable, it would in effect crowd out other renewables that we want to encourage to be developed. That was the reason why in the uh, compromise on the RES that we said that uh, a future, uh, future nuclear power would be uh, 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 not considered in the base for how much would have to be achieved for the uh, renewable objectives. And I, uh, I think this amendment overturns the compromise, undermines what we're trying to do in the renewable area, discourages the development of new renewables that need attention and need uh, guarantee uh, that they're going to be uh, 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 marketable uh, in order to uh, make more uh, renewable fuels available. Uh, Would the gentleman yield the gentleman for a brief question? Yes, I'll be glad to yield, Mr. Uh, Rep. One of the uh, one of the things that, that other countries do, France, uh, UK, Japan, soon to be China, they, they are now in the process of recycling uh, nuclear, spent nuclear fuel, high level nuclear fuel. Uh, our country, of course, has a ban on that. I'd like to think that at some point down the line we will reverse that, we'll, we'll start that in this country. If, in fact, we had that program here, would the gentleman then support this amendment if we could recycle it, knowing that you can do it let, let me, 90 percent? Uh, let me not make a decision here, sitting here without getting all the information. Maybe, maybe not, but uh, I, I don't want to decide M it now. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Since I Morgan. yielded back early, if I could just make a point, and I appreciate your yielding to me. I, I think as we look at these renewables, any of us could make an argument that something has to happen to develop them. For example, there's a fairly high intensity of energy that's consumed to create solar panels. We're actually making them in my state. There are things that have to be mined that go into those solar panels. When you look at the wind turbines that are going up in rapid pace in my district, there's a lot of carbon, there's a lot of steel, there's uh, all the electrical components. A and so into every source of energy, even renewable, uh, part of how you get it into the transmission line, part of the, the, the equipment and the, the, the towers and the blades and all of that uh, requires some, some level of energy. Actually, and interestingly enough, and I haven't mentioned this word yet this morning, but I will, uh, woody biomass <laughs> is the most renewable probably thing out there because it just keeps growing. And so I hope that uh, at some point we can fix that problem in this bill. This would do that. All this bill says, all this amendment says is um, as long as you don't emit, we're trying to get deal with this carbon issue in the atmosphere is what, what this bill is trying to achieve. Why don't you work with us to, uh, to generate new power from sources that don't add to greenhouse gas emissions like hydro, like biomass, like nuclear, um, to, to deal with the atmospheric issues that, that uh, the IPCC and others have, have said are so important to deal with. So I, I hope you'll take another look at this amendment and, and support it. And I appreciate your courtesy in yielding your time to me on that. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Reclaiming, Chairman my, you? reclaiming my time, uh, I, I'd be happy to continue to work with the gentleman, not to continue, to begin to work with the gentleman because uh, we've been very anxious to do that. But this amendment is, is not acceptable. And those other decisions that uh, you, you would like us to look at for the future, I think we need to examine carefully and see if there's a way we can reach agreement. Mr. Chairman, will you yield? My time has expired, and I'm going to recognize Mr. Barton, and he can yield to Mr. Chairman, I he thank you, fit. and I'll yield some of my time to Mr. Gingrey. Um, I don't know if it's good news or bad news, Mr. Chairman, but this was the nice amendment. You know, this is the amendment we're actually put forward thinking that uh, it would be accepted and you would work with us on this. Um, the authors of the legislation are at war with themselves. The stated goal of this legislation uh, is to reduce um, greenhouse gases 
that are made by man in the United States. That's a noble goal. If that's truly the goal and the primary goal, this amendment should be accepted because it's, um, um, it's politically neutral. It simply says any source of electric generation that has emissions of air pollutants that don't exceed those of the emissions listed in the preceding paragraphs, uh, which have the highest emission levels, would qualify. And you're exactly right. Uh, nuclear power would qualify because it is zero emissions. Uh, hydro would qualify because it has zero emissions. Uh, it is possible that clean coal technology uh, at some point in time would qualify. Uh, it is possible uh, that several other technologies that we don't even know about uh, would qualify. But what this amendment does is it, it takes the politics out of the definition of renewable. Uh, if your goal is to reduce man-made greenhouse gases in the United States, this amendment should be accepted. If that's not the primary goal, if the primary goal is to pick winners and losers uh, in the emerging uh, alternative technologies, it's a different ball game. Uh, I would point out that some of the sources that are listed, um, some of the solar voltaics and things of that sort, are extremely expensive and very, very unlikely to ever be large baseload sources of energy. On the other hand, uh, you know, hydroelectric power and uh, nuclear power from these new um, reactor designs uh, could be very much a part of a future um, uh, clean energy strategy. I would also point out what Mr. Upton did, and that is that if, if the United States reverses Carter administration policy and decides to reprocess its spent um, civilian uh, commercial uh, reactor uh, uh, rods, uh, you can recycle, I think, about 98 percent, is it 90, of the energy that's in those rods, uh, which would diminish the need for a Yucca Mountain or similar type repository. So. This is a difficult one to, um, I would think, to, uh, to say no to, and I would hope that some members of the majority would say yes and join with the uh, minority to pass it. Uh, and I'll yield to Mr. Gingrey. And I, I, I thank the ranking member for yielding, and I, I certainly I do support the amendment. Uh, and I think it's important to, to, to note that while uh, the, the chairman uh, says uh, uh, uranium uh, is not uh, uh, re renewable. Uh, it indeed is ubiquitous. Uh, if coal is plentiful in this country, and indeed it is, we probably have 150 years worth of reserves of coal, uh, uranium may be the most uh, abundant uh, element on, on the periodic table. Uh, and and it's, it, it's easily mined. It's here in the United States. We don't have to be dependent on some country that uh, uh, doesn't like us very much. So, uh, for, and then, of course, uh, 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 the, the point was brought up uh, by Mr. Upton that, that the reprocessing technique that's used in France where 80 percent of their power is generated from nuclear, uh, it is so close to being a renewable source that uh, uh, you, you just, I, I can't understand why we wouldn't include it. Uh, and the other thing, the final point I will make is, uh, with nuclear, you cannot pick winners and losers. Uh, you can put a nuclear plant pretty much anywhere. Uh, we're going to have four in the southeast in my state of Georgia uh, at uh, Plant Vogel and Plant Hatch. Uh, and we're producing 20 percent of our electricity by nuclear, and we can grow that. So. Uh, I, I thank the gentleman for yielding time. I'll yield back to him. But uh, clearly, nuclear uh, is so darn close to being renewable that uh, I think it meets the definition. And I yield back. The uh, gentleman's time has expired. For the last uh, f five minutes of debate on this amendment, I want to recognize Mr. Markey. But before I do, if, if I might, on that f five minutes, uh, indicate that uh, we're not arguing whether nuclear should be used. We're not arguing whether coal should be used. We want uh, sources of energy to be used that uh, can be used uh, 
in a way that protects the environment. And we're, we're able to do that with, with nuclear now, and we hope to be able to do that with coal at some point, and we're putting a lot of money into achieving that objective. But this is a question that goes to the definition of renewable. Mr. Barton says perhaps the majority is at war with itself. Well, let me indicate the majority is going to win the war because <laughs> with, yourself. with ourselves, because what we uh, wanted to do was encourage the use of a wide diversity of fuels, nuclear, coal, natural gas, oil, and renewables, some of which are already available and much more will be very uh, effective and low cost if we uh, if we uh, give the encouragement and the market to, for it to be developed. Mr. Markey, to close the debate. I thank the uh, chair very much. Um, as the amendment is drafted, it says that any source of electric generation with emissions of air pollutants that do not exceed those of the emission source listed in any of the preceding paragraphs um, will essentially qualify. Well, our definition for renewables in the legislation that we are now considering is that 20 percent of electricity by the year 2020 should come from renewables or efficiency. Since 20 percent of all electricity in the United States today is generated by nuclear power, that would mean that there would be no new renewables at all, since the entire standard would be met by the existing base of nuclear power in our country. A perfect match. 20 percent nuclear already in existence. 20 percent is what we are calling for. Would for the gentleman yield on that point? Brief. I would be glad to yield. If, if, um, if this were to pass, we would be willing to accept an amendment to, to change the standard to 30 percent, perhaps. Move it up so that you, you get nuclear and you get your others, too. Well, again, let me, let me continue. Hydropower is another 6 percent already in existence. As the chairman already pointed out, our goal is not in this legislation to harm nuclear power. In fact, most of the major nuclear energy utilities in the United States have endorsed this bill. And the reason that they have endorsed it is that they know that once there is a cap placed on carbon, that their ability to go to the capital markets to raise money, combined with the loan guarantee programs, which the Federal Government has already authorized, will increase the revival of the industry, which the gentleman from Georgia has already indicated is occurring uh, at the Vogel site in his state already. So this is really not a question of whether or not nuclear is going to be a part of the mix in the future. It has been in the past. It will be again. And this bill is going to play a large role in reviving it, regardless of what anyone might think about it as a technology. This legislation, however, is also trying to focus upon biomass, on wind, on solar, on geothermal, on hydrokinetic and on a whole group of other technologies which historically have been underfunded. The nuclear sector itself over the years has been a favored technology of the Federal Government, and that is why it is up to 20 percent of our total electricity mix. That is why there is more electricity generated from nuclear in the United States than there is in the country of France. And it is going to continue to increase. And the gentleman from Georgia is saying that he already is witnessing that down in his home state. So the evisceration of the renewable goals which we have for our country uh, would be complete if this amendment was adopted. I can't urge more strongly that the members reject it. This is part of a very well-balanced plan that we have going forward that includes clean coal, uh, tens of billions of dollars for carbon sequestration for the coal industry. Nuclear has loan guarantee programs and other programs that are included 
I urge a no vote so that the renewables can play the same role in the future as these other energy technologies. All time has been uh, complete. All time has been uh, taken in the debate. We will now proceed to a roll call vote. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Waxman. No. Mr. Waxman votes no. Mr. Dingell. Mr. Markey. Mr. Markey votes no. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Boucher votes no. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Rush. Ms. Eshoo. Ms. Eshoo, no. Mr. Stupak. Mr. Engel. Mr. Green. Mr. Green votes no. Ms. DeGette. Ms. DeGette De votes no. Mrs. Caps. Mrs. Caps, no. Mr. Doyle. Ms. Harmon. Ms. Schakowsky. Ms. Schakowsky votes no. Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Gonzalez, no. Mr. Inslee. Mr. Inslee, no. Ms. Baldwin. Ms. Baldwin, no. Mr. Ross. Mr. Weiner. Mr. Weiner, no. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Butterfield. Mr. Butterfield, no. Mr. Melanson. Mr. Melanson votes no. Mr. Barrow. Mr. Barrow votes aye. Mr. Hill. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui votes no. Mrs. Christensen. Mrs. Christensen, no. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor, no. Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Sarbanes, no. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut. Mr. Murphy, no. Mr. Space. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney votes no. Ms. Sutton. Ms. Sutton votes no. Mr. Braley. Mr. Braley, no. Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch votes no. Mr. Barton. Ms. Barton votes aye. Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall votes aye. Mr. Upton. Mr. Upton, aye. Mr. Stearns. Mr. Stearns, aye. Mr. Deal. Mr. Deal, aye. Mr. Whitfield. Mr. Whitfield, aye. Mr. Shimkus. Mr. Shimkus, aye. Mr. Shattuck. Mr. Shattuck, aye. Mr. Blunt. Mr. Blunt votes aye. Mr. Boyer. Mr. Boyer, aye. Mr. Radonovich. Mr. Radonovich, aye. Mr. Pitts. Mr. Pitts votes aye. Ms. Bono Mack. Ms. Bono Mack, aye. Mr. Walden. Mr. Walden, aye. 
Mr. Terry. Aye. Mr. Terry, aye. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers, aye. Mrs. Myrick. Mrs. Myrick votes aye. Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania. Mr. Murphy votes aye. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess, aye. Ms. Blackburn. Ms. Blackburn, aye. Mr. Gingry. Mr. Gingry, aye. Mr. Scullis. Mr. Scullis votes aye. Mr. Dingle. Mr. Dingle votes no. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Pallone votes no. Mr. Stupak. Mr. Stupak, no. Mr. Rush. Mr. Rush votes no. Yeah, I see him. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Doyle votes no. Ms. Harmon. Ms. Harmon votes no. Mr. Ross. Mr. Ross votes aye. Mr. Hill. Mr. Hill votes aye. Have all members responded Mr. to the call of the roll? Mr. Space. Right. Mr. Space. Mr. Space, aye. What do you have? 30 for you and 26 for me. Mm. Clerk, ready to report the vote? Yes, sir. On that vote, Mr. Chairman, the yeas were 26 and the nays were 29. 26 ayes, 29 noes. The amendment is not agreed to. The chair would like to now look to the Democratic side. And Mr. Space, I understand you have an amendment at the desk. The uh, The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Space of Ohio. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read. We'll have it distributed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And the gentleman is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this amendment, Mr. Chairman, helps uh, clarify and particular, particularize certain agricultural offsets uh, a rather comprehensive list that has been uh, uh, prepared uh, in consultation with farmers uh, uh, both in my district and throughout the state of Ohio. One of the concerns that farmers have raised uh, regarding the offsets program is the lack of specificity. And uh, this amendment would, uh, would simply uh, provide that specificity and certainty in the process and I think make uh, many of our farmers more comfortable uh, with the legislation. Gentlemen, yield to me. Certainly. Uh, I understand the concerns you're raising that this amendment is trying to address. The agricultural and forestry, forestry sectors engage in many activities that sequester substantial amounts of carbon. These activities are expected to provide a significant source of low-cost emission offsets under this bill, and producing and selling such offsets could ha help provide farmers and timber interests an important new source of income. I join your interest in ensuring that high quality agricultural offsets play a significant role in achieving the bill's emission, emissions reduction goals as cost effectively as possible. I do have some concerns about the amendment as drafted. The amendment provides a very detailed list of specific activities that would receive offset credits, 
but just listing an activity doesn't make it a source of offsets. Before offsets can be issued, EPA must develop a, uh, a ways to uh, measure how much carbon each activity would sequester in the soil or in biomass. Then EPA can issue one offset for every ton of carbon sequestered. I think we need to make sure that EPA has the measurement methodologies in place before we give offset credits to specific activities. And these methodologies involve highly technical scientific calculations that must be left to the expert agency. So I don't think it makes sense to try to spell all this out before EPA and the Offsets Integrity Advisory Board established by this legislation have a chance to assess the carbon sequestered by each of these activities. But I agree that EPA and the Offsets Integrity Advisory Board should consider each of these activities and should develop measurement methodologies for every source of high quality offsets. If the gentleman is willing to withdraw his amendment, I propose that we insert language into the committee report laying out this list and directing EPA and the Offsets Integrity Advisory Board to consider each of these activities as a potential source of offset credits. And I'd be willing to work further on this matter with the gentleman as this bill moves forward. I thank the chairman for his concern. And given uh, the representations made back today, would the gentleman Sorry to interrupt. What, before you withdraw, would you yield me a, a few seconds? Or me? Either one. Oh, sorry. To yield the gentleman uh, 30 seconds. Uh, I, too, am concerned on behalf of our farmers. Uh, there's another aspect here that I'd like to just bring up for discussion, and that's livestock, where, according to this plan, they have no opportunities for any type of credits because critters tend to burp and flagellate and eat corn, which, according to uh, yesterday's discussion is going to be a net contributor uh, to carbon because that's going to be processed or, I mean, included in this. So livestock needs to be accounted for in here and is not. I'll yield back to my friend from Ohio. I thank the gentleman for his concern. And uh, given the... Uh, would the gentleman yield to Mr. Barton? Oh, I think of he course. Would make a comment I'd just say we would accept it as is. And um, I'd like to add to the list, but I will accept what you've got. It's a move in the right direction. Uh, thank you uh, to the ranking member as well. Uh, given the chairman's uh, uh, representations concerning his willingness to work with us uh, and the concerns raised both here in this hearing as well as in advance, uh, I would withdraw the uh, amendment and look forward would, to working with the chairman. Would the gentleman, the chairman, would the uh, gentleman in, yield? In refining this list. Would the gentleman yield? For uh, the I president? yield my time back to uh, the Then I reserve a right to no, object ahead, to the unanimous ahead. consent. Well, there is no unanimous consent uh, request. Withdraw. Uh, but uh, let's see. Uh, why don't you yield, Mr. Space? I, I just have a quick. Morgan. I'll yield the remaining time. Well, I just have a question for you. As I was reading it, on page 2, it, on line 14, it talks about afforestation or reforestation of acreage not forested as of October 18, 2007. W where did that date come from? It's very specific. And I'm just, we, I actually was Googling trying to figure out what event happened on that day. And I, I'm just curious. It's a, it, it, That's a, it is a curious anomaly. And my response to that uh, would be simply that uh, this list is comprehensive and was prepared in connection with consultation with members of the agricultural industry and community. And the honest truth is I'm not sure where the date is. Right. It does appear arbitrary. But yeah, uh, I, it the, just caught my attention. It, it sure. seemed, I don't know why the 16th or the 19th or, you know. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. How you Thank back? you. Gentleman from Ohio withdraws his amendment. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. Rogers for the purposes of, purpose of offering an amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read and the gentleman be recognized for five minutes. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I would uh, move that uh, the Rogers Amendment 2, 4, and 6 be considered on block in the interests of time today. Without objection, the uh, amendments. Mr. Chairman, I reserve a point of order. Okay, well, first of all, the, the uh, gentleman reserves a point of order, but without objection, the amendments will be considered on block. And uh, Mr. Rogers is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, I come from a state that's been hit very, very hard 
Thanks. And I have to tell you, when you're sitting at your kitchen table and, and you work for a small auto parts manufacturer, you kind of have to scratch your head. Michigan is very proud of the role that they played in World War II as the arsenal of democracy. When the, when the United States called them, uh, they went from making pickup trucks in about late 1940 uh, with 15,000 parts to less than a year later on that same assembly line pumping out bombers with over a million parts. Helped create the middle class. Rosie the Riveter got their start in Michigan. Kind of changed for a whole generation about how we embrace people into the workplace. So they scratch their heads and think, now, let, I'm a little confused. This is a great country through innovation. Uh, the government didn't tell them how to do that. They just asked them to go from pickup trucks to airplanes. Nobody told them to do the Chevy Volt, of which they've spent billions of their own money at General Motors to research and develop and get close to production or lithium ion batteries. But now, somehow, we've given up on all of that, and we're going to ask that particular family to pay a very heavy price. We're going to ask that family to pay more for their electric bills, more for their natural gas. And how is this going to solve the problem? Well, what they're going to do is they're going to take money from those individuals, money from small businesses, and we're going to send it to Wall Street to trade in a commodity that you can't see and you can never, ever take delivery of. And oh, by the way, we've even figured out to put a loophole in here for overseas credit. So companies, if they have uh, uh, operations overseas, they get to figure out a new way on Wall Street to get credits there and bring it back and make more money off of the very people who are sitting at the kitchen table trying to figure out how to pay their light bill. And they scratch their heads some more and say, wait a minute, in the last 100 days, this, this, the democratically controlled government of the United States forced out auto dealers about, I don't know, I guess they're up to over 3,000 of them. The government forced them to do that. Hundreds of thousands of people will lose their jobs because the government told them to close. By the way, those are private companies with private assets. Oh, and here's the other answer that they came up with the government proffered viability plan for General Motors. And I'm going to quote from a UAW letter sent to us May 15, 2009. They were asking members of Congress to join with them and talking to the Obama administration so that GM should be required to maintain the maximum number of jobs in the United States instead of outsourcing more production to other countries. Because of the government proffered viability plan, they're going to go from, uh, let's see, the share of GM sales in the U.S. market that will be imported from these countries will increase from 15.5% to 23.5%. And by the way, they're going to close 16 U.S. manufacturing facilities. They're going to close them here from my friends on the other side of the aisle and import them from places like, and quoting from again from the UAW letter, Korea, Japan, and China for sale in this country. Thank you for working so hard all those years to develop and build some of the state-of-the-art manufacturing in the United States of America. Here's our gift to you. We're going to charge you more for your electric bill, going to charge you more for your natural gas bill, going to charge you more for your gasoline. Every product that you use will go up in price. Oh, and thanks a lot. We're going to ask that we import more vehicles because somehow maybe that helps our carbon footprint. I don't know. And then they read this in the paper. As Detroit crumbles, China emerges as auto epicenter. They are fast after it, gang. They want our middle class. And they're going to do everything they can to steal it. And what you do with this bill, and what you didn't do by adding India and China is saying, hey, listen, you either need to be with us or we, we're not going to let you artificially steal these jobs of people who are killing themselves to make it. You say tough. And you know what? You say so tough, and we say, yeah, we know we're going to lose jobs. How do you do that? Because in Title IV, you have Section 422, 425, 426, and 427 said, boy, we know we're going to lose a lot of jobs, and you budget somewhere up to $380 billion a year in a separate program to pay for all the jobs that you know you're going to lose in this bill. And it's not even part of unemployment. You created a whole new government program. So a government program to take their money away from them, charge them more to get up in the morning and use their water and their electricity and make their eggs and their kids to do their homework and to drive to work. You have a government program to do that. And oh, by the way, we know that's really stupid. So we're going to create a whole other government program to give you uh, wages and we're going to pay for some of your health care for up to three years because we know this is really kind of a bad idea. But you know what? Get over it. It's the buggy whip time. But you know what? 
The buggy whip went away. We're still going to buy cars in America. We're still going to produce things. And this is what you do. 577,000 Americans earn a mean salary of $44,000 a year making auto parts. Goodbye. 210,000 Americans work directly in auto manufacturing. They earn a mean salary of $59,000. Goodbye. This bill says this. Give these people a break. If China and India don't comply, if we do lose one single job in this sector due to this bill, stop. Let them breathe. Let them send their kids to college. Let them earn and be a part of the American dream. And I yield back the remainder of my time. Chairman, I withdraw my reservation. The gentleman's time has expired. Are any members seeking recognition in opposition to the Rogers Amendment? The chair recognizes the gentlelady from Ohio, Ms. Sutton. I thank the gentleman, and I thank the gentleman for his uh, amendment and for his remarks. But, um, you know, as, as we have gone through this process, of course, we have incorporated into this bill the Cash for Clunkers pro proposal, which is aimed indeed not just at um, dealing with the issue of job loss after the fact, but rather in, is, is intended to help those very dealers that we're talking about, and, and as well as improving our environment at the same time. And obviously, multiple benefits uh, are a good thing in helping consumers while we're at it. And I would just ask my friend from Michigan, as I know how difficult it is, because coming from where I come from, we face much of the same concern. Um, I, too, saw the letter from the United Auto Workers, and it's a rather lengthy letter, and it has uh, many statements in it. Of course, one of the things that it asks us to do is to, uh, to, to communicate with the president, and I just don't know. Um, I would just ask the gentleman if he has taken the opportunity to send him a letter. Uh, we absolutely have. And remember, this, this, this is the second viability plan that was proffered by the, the president's government run car committee to run the car companies. Well, well, I disagree, um, uh, claiming my time, I disagree with the assertions that are being made that the, that the government is the one that is forcing the closings of the dealerships. And I appreciate your, uh, yes, I, I do, I disagree with that. This, uh, I disagree with that. And it's we the can car czar and the car committee who is appointed by the president of the United I, States. I understand, but the decisions are being made by the companies on what dealerships to close. By the they fired and the guy I that came up with the plan that time, didn't Reclaiming have my time, it. reclaiming my time. But what I would just encourage, and I look forward to doing with the gentleman from Michigan, is taking steps both within this committee and outside of this committee to pursue the actions to stop the job loss. But this bill here is not what is going to cause the auto industry to continue to suffer. And by the time this would kick in, even if your scenario was correct, those folks would be in a world of hurt and this would not be something that would help them. We need to take action today, like the Cash for Clunkers proposal and other initiatives to make sure that the scenario you point out in this amendment that would, in effect, kill the bill, kill the program in the bill, kill the program in the bill, doesn't actually come to fruition. And I look forward to working with you in every way that we can outside of this committee, in this committee, along the way to make sure that uh, that, that happens. And I yield back my time. General Lady's time has expired. Uh, are there other members wishing to speak Mr. on the Rogers Amendment? The chair recognizes the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Boya. I move to strike the last word. Uh, the gentleman is recognized for that purpose. What I've done is uh, I've gone back to my math again, and I encourage all members to once again do math in the bill. So, Mr. Rogers, I'd like for you to know that the authors of this legislation have taken your concerns into advance, uh, into consideration, because they have created a climate change worker adjustment assistant program, which is modeled after the TAA in, in NAFTA. Can I, guys, can I? Please. Um, and so when I, when I do this, I use the Indiana's wage average, which is 37,770. Now keep in mind, though, that the national average, guys, can you please? The average is 43,000 according to the Bureau of Labor. So let me, let's just do a back of the envelope math. So I want to I address your concerns, uh, Mr. Rogers, that are in the bill. 
So if it's modeled after the TA new program, displaced workers are entitled to 156 weeks of income supplement. We have unemployment income assistance uh, shall be 70 percent of the average weekly wage of the worker, not to exceed the state's average wage. So uh, uh, we have a displaced workers entitled to 80 percent of a monthly health care premium, of which uh, we have an average cost of $1,545. We have displaced workers entitled to 1,500 job assistance and displaced workers entitled to 1,500 moving assistance, job counseling, and training. Now, let's do the, do the math, and I'm going to do this sort of based on Indiana. So if the, on annual compensation, the bill provides up to 37,770 unemployment assistance to workers. If we accept what Heritage says about a loss of about 2.5 million jobs, if I add in just the Indiana, I'm not even doing the national average, so I'll do a little low cost, low balling here, that comes up to $94 billion. When I add in the health care benefit to this, um, if we do 80% of the premium, so that's 1236 annually per person uh, times 2.5 million, that's a $3 billion cost. If I do the job assistance, provides up to 1500 in job assistance counseling times the 2.5, that's a $3.75 billion cost. If I add the job moving, along with job, job moving is about $3.75 billion. If I do the job training, which it costs on average $8,000 times the 2.5 million jobs, that's $20 billion. So you add up $94.4 billion, $3.09 billion, plus $3.75 billion, plus $3.75 billion again, and $20 billion in job training. Mr. Rogers, I'd like for you to know that in the bill, your concern with regard to individuals that are going to lose their jobs, the bill provides $125 billion in job assistance. So what, I've, uh, what I realize here is, is that we are going to uh, borrow from the Chinese, but collateral on this loan will be these manufacturing jobs for which you have dire concern about. I'll yield to the gentleman from Michigan. Uh, I would thank the gentleman. I, just, I appreciate the, that, uh, that you'd bring that up. And, and one of the things that we have to understand is that in this bill, uh, as you have pointed out, the dollar amount. But there's also a whole other section on the training dollars that we added up that takes it up to as much as $380 billion a year for people they know will lose their jobs in this bill. And there's other programs. That doesn't count one penny of a new government program we're going to create to try to figure out, after we have hurt the poor in this country, by raising their electric bill somewhere between $1,500 and $3,100 per year extra, we're going to create another program to try to figure out how we took that money from them in the first place and figure out how to get it back. And I guess our argument on this is there is so much a better way to do this, that through innovation versus this big government mandate of taking and figuring out who wins and who loses and who gets some allocation. And by the way, even the chairman of this committee, the sponsor of this bill, said that he didn't even know what all was in this bill yesterday. So we're going to vote on a bill that we think is somewhere around $2.3 trillion that will clearly, clearly, clearly cost jobs. Otherwise, you wouldn't have so many different sections in this bill dedicated to those people who you know are going to lose their jobs. And a whole other section trying to figure out how to keep the poor from going under by a new government program to figure out how we get their new cost in energy back to them in some form. Of course, it won't be 100 percent because that never quite works when you send a dollar to Washington, D.C. And our argument is there is a better, more innovative way. Don't give up on the next generation of Americans. Don't quit on them. This bill quits on them. It says you don't believe that they can do it, that they can innovate, that they can do things like send a man to the moon, as you said. By the way, if they didn't meet that deadline, hundreds of thousands of people didn't lose their jobs. Big difference. Believe in this next generation of Americans, and you will be surprised how fast we meet these goals without a huge government mandate and the largest energy tax in the history of the United States. Time has expired. Are we uh, ready for the question? Or does any other member wish to speak on the five minutes that we could take on the Democratic side? If not, we'll proceed to a vote. Uh, clerk will call the roll. Mr. Waxman. No. 
Mr. Waxman votes no. Mr. Dingell. Mr. Dingell votes no. Mr. Markey. Mr. Markey votes no. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Rush. Ms. Eshoo. Ms. Eshoo votes no. Mr. Stupak. Mr. Engel. Mr. Green. Ms. Deget. Ms. Deget votes no. Mrs. Caps. Mrs. Caps votes no. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Doyle votes no. Ms. Harmon. Ms. Joukowsky. Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Gonzalez votes no. Mr. Inslee. Mr. Inslee votes no. Ms. Baldwin. Ms. Baldwin votes no. Mr. Ross. Mr. Ross votes no. Mr. Weiner. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Butterfield. Mr. Butterfield votes no. Mr. Melanson. Mr. Melanson votes no. Mr. Barrow. Mr. Barrow votes no. Mr. Hill. Mr. Hill votes no. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui votes no. Mrs. Christensen. Mrs. Christensen, no. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor votes no. Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut. Mr. Murphy, no. Mr. Space. Mr. Space, no. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney, no. Ms. Sutton. Ms. Sutton votes no. Mr. Braley. Mr. Braley, no. Mr. Welch. No. Mr. Welch, no. Mr. Barton. Mr. Barton votes aye. Mr. Hall. Mr. Upton. Mr. Upton, aye. Mr. Stearns. Mr. Stearns, aye. Mr. Deal. Mr. Whitfield. Mr. Whitfield, aye. Mr. Shimkus. Mr. Shimkus, aye. Mr. Shattuck. Mr. Shattuck, aye. Mr. Blunt. Mr. Blunt votes aye. Mr. Boyer. Mr. Boyer votes aye. Mr. Radonovich. Mr. Radonovich, aye. Mr. Pitts. Mr. Pitts, aye. Ms. Bono Mack. Aye. Ms. Bono Mack, aye. Mr. Walden. Aye. Mr. Walden, aye. Mr. Terry. Aye. Mr. Terry votes aye. Mr. Rogers. Aye. Mr. Rogers, aye. Mrs. Myrick. Aye. Mrs. Myrick votes aye. Mr. Sullivan. Aye. Mr. Sullivan, aye. Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania. Mr. Murphy, aye. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess, aye. Ms. Blackburn. Aye. Ms. Blackburn, aye. Mr. Gingry. Aye. Mr. Gingry, aye. Mr. Scalise. Aye. Mr. Scalise, aye. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Boucher votes no. Mr. Rush. Mr. Rush, no. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Pallone, no. Mr. Stupak. Mr. Stupak, no. Mr. Matheson. 
Mr. Matheson, no. Ms. Schakowsky? Ms. Schakowsky, no. Mr. Hall? Mr. Hall votes aye. Mr. Green? Mr. Green? No. Mr. Green votes no. Mr. Weiner, how do you wish to vote? Not recorded, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Weiner votes no. <laughs> Mr. Weiner votes no. Any member wish to be uh, recorded that's not recorded or recorded in a different way? If not, the clerk will uh, announce the vote. On that vote, Mr. Chairman, the ayes were 22 and the nays were 32. 30, 22 ayes, 32 noes, the amendment's not agreed to. Who wishes to be recognized? Mr. Uh, Malanson, I understand you have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will, re, uh, the, the clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Melanson of Louisiana. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read, and the gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. I, uh, I wanted to introduce this amendment uh, because of the issue with uh, mid-level ethanol uh, additive and the concern with the manufacturers of the engines, uh, whether they're automobile engines, uh, marine engines, uh, whatever. Uh, that could be impacted. Uh, as a person who has experienced ethanol uh, additives in a marine engine, uh, fortunately I only had to overhaul the engine afterward. I didn't have to replace it completely, but um, I've had the experience, so it comes firsthand. And I would hope that no one else has to go through that uh, because of something that we're doing for the good of the country. Uh, I'd ask that the, we request for waivers to allow the E15 blends uh, and that we take a look at the science first. Uh, we should encourage more deployment of biofuels, but not without considering the impact of legacy systems. Uh, make sure that core warranties are kept intact. Uh, emergency generators after storms are still running, uh, which is very important to the folks in my region of the country. Uh, and that the outdoor engines, marine and otherwise, um, uh, assets that people invest in uh, can be protected. This amendment simply asks the Science Advisory Board of EPA to take advice from scientific community before they provide a waiver uh, to E15 and to make sure that in the event that there is any potential problems, uh, that E10 would be available in, throughout the entire country to make sure that those people who still had warranties and or engines uh, that did not perform uh, with the mid-level ethanol uh, additive uh, would be protected and be able to continue operating those, those vehicles. Um, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, introduce this amendment and um, I wanted it to make sure that it was on the radar screen and included in the record. Uh, and with that, I would withdraw it, Mr. Chairman, and deal back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman uh, from Louisiana for uh, uh, withdrawing his amendment and raising this very important issue. We uh, will now go to the Republican side. Mr. Blunt, do you have uh, a Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment uh, at the desk. It's uh, amendment number um, 595A, and it's the amendment that says 20%. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read. What is he doing? Are we waiting for the amendment to be uh, distributed, Chairman? Yeah, uh, let's see. It looks like there's some question of whether it's there. This is 
not a non-block amendment, correct? Uh, apparently, uh, we offered that, and I think it's not on block. It's just one amendment. While it's being distributed, the gentleman's break. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, this is an amendment that uh, I hope the majority will find an improved amendment over an amendment uh, uh, I offered um, a, a couple of days ago. Uh, this amendment, again, deals with residential utility rates. Uh, it's an amendment that creates a way for the administrator of the EPA uh, to determine uh, the residential rates in the country uh, and if um, and and the the EPA administrator I'm told does this in any case so this information is available uh, if the administrator would determine uh, that the average retail price of electricity for end users uh, in one or more of the nine census divisions of the country has increased by more than 20 percent from the 2009 rate plus inflation so you get the 2009 rate, you get inflation, and then you'd get up to 20 percent before this uh, amendment would have impact. Uh, and if the administrator determines uh, that this, uh, this increase of more than 20 percent above inflation was the result of the implementation of Title III of this Act, then the provisions of Title III uh, will cease to be effective. Uh, the rest of the amendment, the rest of the act would be effective. The chairman had some concern that uh, people would not be able to move forward with other activities under the bill if the entire act was not effective uh, and the uh, rest of the act would be effective under this amendment. Only Title III would not be. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd point out even yesterday uh, at the first meeting, a webcast meeting of the President's um, Selected Economic Recovery Advisory Board. Uh, that board had a number of concerns about uh, this act. Uh, Martin Felstein uh, from Harvard uh, told uh, the president that the cost per capita of this act could range from $400 to $1,500 uh, per person in additional annual expenses. Now, for a family of, of um, the average family in the country is, I think, two, two and a half, two point five six. 2.56. Uh, that cost is substantial in that household. This would address the utility uh, portion of that cost, and uh, I'd hope that uh, our members would um, look at uh, Title III, and if Title III is a reason for an increase of 20 percent or more above inflation, the Title III would cease to be effective. Uh, and I'd yield uh, the time yield? to uh, Mr. Upton. Well, thank, thank you, uh, my friend from Missouri. I, I just want to say this is this would almost be a Gore amendment. And that when the vice president was here, he said that I think that rates wouldn't go up more than a postage stamp. Well, uh, we're we're insisting that it be 20 percent nationally. I know some states, uh, particularly those with a heavy reliance on coal. I looked to Indiana. I looked to Ohio. I looked to Michigan. I looked at much of the Midwest, where coal generates as much as 90 percent of our electricity and some of those utilities have talked about a 40 or 50 percent increase in rates, but this is a 20 percent national rate just as a safeguard to make sure, in fact, that, that uh, this bill doesn't gouge consumers. And so I, I think it's a worthwhile uh, amendment. I, know, I think we picked up some Democratic uh, support on uh, a couple days ago when you had a, a lower percentage. I would like to think that we might be able to get this knowing that it's 20 percent, in essence, plus inflation over that 09 rate, and I look forward to the vote, and I yield back. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield some time to Ms. Blackburn from Tennessee. I thank the gentleman for yielding, and I thank him for this amendment. I do support the amendment. I would just like to point out in Tennessee what we are looking at. Our residential usage is expected to go up 42 percent under this legislation. That would be a $612 increase for our residences, our commercial rates. We expect to see that be about a $2,500 per year increase for our commercial users. Our industrial users are looking at a $36,000 increase. And that is because of the expectation of a 42 percent increase in those rates. And both the rate and what you are paying matters. I applaud the gentleman. 
This would stop this at 20 percent. That would cut the increase in half for what is expected. I thank him. I support it, and I yell back. Mr. Chairman, I, Mr. Chairman, I, I'd yield back the remainder. Gentleman, the gentleman yields back the time. Uh, the chair would uh, speak in opposition. Very, very briefly, we've had this debate and this issue over and over again. Uh, it's pretty much the same as what uh, Mr. Blunt offered uh, and to Title I, uh, except uh, it's almost word for word, but there are some minor changes. The bill still directly uh, protects consumers from increases by allocating 30 Nine percent of allowances to the return to be returned to consumers via, uh, via local distribution companies, and uh, what uh, consumers care about are, are the bills and not the rates. Uh, this uh, uh, this provision would uh, strike as a result of uh, 20 percent increase that the provisions of Title III would cease to be effective. I, I, it's, it's not a reasonable, in my view, way to respond to that kind of a circumstance. And uh, uh, I, I would hope that we would oppose this as we've done it, uh, similar amendments that have been offered in the last couple of days. And I yield to uh, uh, Mr. Butterfield. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I rise in opposition to this amendment. Mr. Chairman, there is no one on this committee who is more concerned about the potential for rate increases for our ratepayers. Uh, but this is not the way to address the problem. Uh, I am very concerned about this potential. I have expressed that publicly and privately. Uh, the chairman has reached a very good compromise whereby many of the LDCs, all of the LDCs, will get uh, free allowances that will pass through to the ratepayers. Yeah. And I think that's a good way of dealing with it. It will offset the economic impact and the potential for rate increases. Uh, if that doesn't happen, then we can come back and revisit it. But to uh, suspend the provisions of Title III would not be the way to go. I oppose the amendment. I appreciate what the gentleman has to say, especially now that we have the space amendment uh, as part of the legislation. It's very clear the ratepayers are going to be protected. Uh, I'd like to uh, proceed to a vote. I understand that Republicans would like a roll call vote. Let's call the roll, and I, I, I hope we can complete it uh, before members have to leave. But as your vote name is called, if there's no objection, people can leave. And if all members haven't had a chance to vote, uh, after the roll, we'll, we'll keep the roll open for members to come after the votes on the floor. Mr. Waxman. No. Mr. Waxman votes no. Mr. Dingle. Mr. Dingle, no. Mr. Markey. Mr. Markey votes no. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Gordon, Mr. Rush, Ms. Eshoo, Mr. Stupak, Mr. Stupak votes no, Mr. Engel, Mr. Green, Mr. Green votes no, Ms. DeGett, Ms. DeGett votes no, Mrs. Capps. Mrs. Capps, no. Mr. Doyle, Mr. Doyle, no. Ms. Harmon, Ms. Schakowsky, Ms. Schakowsky, no. Mr. Gonzalez, Mr. Gonzalez, no. Mr. Inslee, Mr. Inslee, no. Ms. Baldwin, Ms. Baldwin, no. Mr. Ross, Mr. Weiner, Mr. Weiner votes no. Mr. Matheson, Mr. Matheson, no. Mr. Butterfield, Mr. Butterfield, no. Mr. Melanson, Mr. Melanson, no. Mr. Barrow, Mr. Barrow votes no. Mr. Hill, Mr. Hill, no. Ms. Matsui, Ms. Matsui, no. Mrs. Christensen. Mrs. Christensen, no. Ms. Castor, Ms. Castor votes no. Mr. Sarbanes, Mr. Sarbanes, no. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut. Mr. Space, Mr. McNerney, Mr. McNerney votes no. Ms. Sutton, Ms. Sutton, 
No. Mr. Braley. Mr. Braley, no. Mr. Welch. No. Mr. Welch, no. Mr. Barton. Mr. Barton votes aye. Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall, aye. Mr. Upton. Aye. Mr. Upton, aye. Mr. Stearns. Mr. Deal. Aye. Mr. Deal, aye. Mr. Whitfield. Mr. Whitfield, aye. Mr. Shimkus. Mr. Shimkus, aye. Mr. Shattuck. Mr. Shattuck, aye. Mr. Bunt. Mr. Blunt. Mr. Blunt, aye. Mr. Boyer. Mr. Boyer votes aye. Mr. Rodanovich. Mr. Rodanovich, aye. Mr. Pitts. Mr. Pitts votes aye. Ms. Bono Mack. Ms. Bono Mack, aye. Mr. Walden. Aye. Mr. Walden, aye. Mr. Terry. Aye. Mr. Terry votes aye. Mr. Rogers. Aye. Mr. Rogers, aye. Mrs. Myrick. Aye. Mrs. Myrick, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Aye. Mr. Sullivan, aye. Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess votes aye. Ms. Blackburn. Ms. Blackburn votes aye. Mr. Gingry. Aye. Mr. Gingry, aye. Mr. Scalise. Aye. Mr. Scalise, aye. Let's see. Hold on. I just want Mr. Pallone. Mr. Pallone votes no. Mr. Ross. Mr. Ross votes no. Mr. Hint, yeah. Mr. Murphy. Mr. Murphy votes no. Any other? After all members Ms. have Eshew. responded to this call, Ms. the Eshew roll will be held no. open and we will return promptly after the last of the three votes on the House floor. It's up. So we recessed. We recessed. So this markup hearing on energy and climate change legislation is taking a recess for votes in the House. This is day four of the hearing. Chairman Waxman has expressed hope that the committee can approve a bill before the end of the day. Once they do, it goes to the House floor. While we wait for members to return, here are remarks made earlier today by President Obama regarding national security. Good morning, everybody. Please be seated. Thank you all for being here. Uh, let me just acknowledge the presence of some of my outstanding 